Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel. I am now a rated Airbus pilot and in this video I want to do a little bit of comparison between the flight warning systems of the Airbus A320 and larger series and the Boeing 737. So we're going to start this off with the Airbus and ultimately I will give my opinion on which one I like better. Alright, so let's go right into it. We're sitting here at the gate and we've got our APU running and the Airbus is in a very good shape. However, let's go ahead and explore how the flight warning computers are going to work and what's going to happen and later on let's see the same in the Boeing 737. Now the latter is going to be rather interesting because I'm sure that there is more to it in the 737 than you actually think. Alright, so let's get started. We will start with the Airbus, and the Airbus is actually rather simple. If something goes wrong, it's going to show, right? Well, almost, because there will be some differences to it as well. For example, there are cautions that simply show without any accompanying attention getter, like master warning or master caution up here. There are warnings which get a single chime, there are some with a continuous repetitive chime, and then there are some which are simply getting suppressed during certain phases of flight. So there is actually a little bit of logic into it, and the computer also does automatic prioritization of the failures that you get. So let's take a let's take an example. We'll take a primary zone controller failure over here. So we can see the failure is in and activation is immediate. And you can see it shows us condition zone regulator fault, but it doesn't tell us any procedure associated with it and the attention getters do not illuminate. So this really tells us, well, there isn't that much to worry about simply for the reason that the alternate controller has taken over. So you can see that up here, alternate mode is enabled. We do have two systems, so we don't get any attention getter coming on over here because it simply is a, oh yeah, that thing is out, but something's taken over. All right, so let's fix that and go ahead with another malfunction, which is probably going to be a little bit um, higher in priority. So on this one, we'll take a pack overheat. So I've just enabled this. It's going to take a little while. We can see the pack temperature rising over here on the bleed page and at a certain threshold value it is going to trigger uh, master caution which is then going to grab our attention. So let's watch this come up. I believe at about 250 degrees the um, system is going to recognize that something is wrong and going to throw us the malfunction. So here we are, 250 time bit more maybe. You can see how the computer is constantly monitoring things but here we are. So we got the master caution, let's reset that. Air pack 1 overheat. And this is a little bit more severe because it needs our attention in that the pack is going to shut down. However, look at this. You can see how the computer has automatically closed the pack valve already <coughs> and so is basically taking care of things. Let's go ahead and work our ECAM procedure. So, pack 1, overheat. Pack 1, off. Okay, that's air condition. Pack 1. We can see the associated fault light up here that we need to check as well. So, when the ECAM throws us a message, we always need to cross-check on the system display, display or on the associated overhead panel lights that there is actually a fault. So, we got the fault light up here. So, let's execute the ECAM. Pack 1, off. Off. You can see this basically doesn't do anything now because the computer has already taken the step before we hit the switch. So we are basically just bringing the switch into alignment with the computer. Now it tells us when pack overheat out, pack one on. So we can now look at the um, temperature over here and turn the pack back on. <laughs> now this is the moment where the instructor would often just kill the fault so that when you actually put it back on, you can see the effect straight away. So air pack one on and you can see that the procedure has now vanished from our ecamp that basically means procedure complete the reset was successful and the pack is working again as we can see over here so now the computer is going to bring things into order again like you can see the right pack is still running on um, high flow the left one onto low flow but that is going to take a little bit of time until it's going to normalize again 
So, <laughs> that is pretty much how the system works in uh, normal conditions. So how about we take something a little bit more uh, serious in order to show how the um, system is going to prioritize things. So let's go ahead and get a trim air fault. So condition, hot air fault, hot air off. Okay, let's not do this for now. Because what we're going to do next is we're going to fail a system that is going to be a little bit more important. So what might that be? Well, let's go ahead and... Um, no, I was about to take a generator offline, but that's maybe not a good idea. But let's go ahead and, for example, switch on the fuel pumps and then we're going to kill a fuel pump. Okay, so let's go into fuel and then fuel pump left one... Okay, let's fail that. So, here we go. Fuel, left tank, pump one, low pressure. And you can see the aircraft is now prioritizing things. So, in this case, it says that the hot air fault is more important than the fuel tank pump fault. Now, that is obviously because we still have redundant pumps, but we don't have a redundant hot air system. So for that reason, the computer is now saying, well, that one is more important than that one. Now, if we were to, for example, light up an APU and put that thing on fire, then we would see that it would even make things a little bit more dire as it is going to prioritize that. Okay, so let's go ahead and go for an APU fire. Now that is going to kill the airplane's electronics and you will see the APU automatically shutting down when that happens, but let's go for it. Okay, see that? The APU has reacted and has automatically shut down, but we can see the firelight illuminate up there. So, for a brief moment you could also see how the APU fire indication was on top of all the others on the uh, ECAM. And if we now go ahead and connect, for example, the ground power unit, then you will be able to see it in action. So, let's go to ground services. I want a ground power unit, please. Thank you. My choice of failure was maybe not the very best, but... It's gonna take 40 seconds for the screen self-test to progress. But you will be able to see how the computer automatically prioritizes things. Now that usually works very, very well. <laughs> there is only a single scenario in which it doesn't work that well, and that is when you have an engine failure on one side and an engine fire on the other. Because fire always has the higher priority in the computer over the um, failure, and for that reason, once the... Um, one, when that happens, it asks you to shut down the burning engine. I did a separate video on that. What's also interesting right now, when the system powers up, is we get the flight warning computer 1 and 2 fold, where it basically tells us now I cannot detect anything anymore. And we see that on the right-hand side here as well, with a not available econ warning and so on. Now the computer started, and you can see how now it has prioritized things. Let's kill that. <coughs> So you can see how it's not now prioritizing things. The fire has highest priority. Below that comes the uh, hot air fault. And below that comes the fuel tank pump fault. And obviously the ECAM also tells us what to do. So for the APU fire, APU fire push button push. So that's the APU fire push button up here. Push. And APU master switch off. What is interesting here? Airbus computer logic. You can see that the... Um, fire agent has actually discharged automatically because the computer is monitoring it and whenever it detects an APU fire on the ground it is simply going to extinguish or attempt to extinguish it automatically. You can see in this case the extinguishing attempt failed so the fire is still burning and with that it simply has master switch off. So let's go ahead and switch it off. Also check the uh, fault light illuminated up there. All right. And with that, the APU fire procedure is complete. And with our APU burning, it is probably time to get out. So we're done with the uh, Airbus computers. And let's now head over to the Boeing and have a look at what things look like over there.
We're now sitting in the Boeing 737 and let's compare that to the Airbus computers. So in the 737 we got the master caution system that is our attention getter and that leads us to the panel where the further fault is then indicated. From there you'd go into the QRH to find your procedure. So let's take a couple examples. Right now we can see we are in a pre-flight stage. So we got the flight control and the electrical systems up here. The electricals because of the generator drive lights and the flight controls because of the hydraulic low pressure lights in the flight control system up there. So what is not illuminated however as you can see is the fuel system or the IRS system. And this is where we're going to start. So let me give you a couple examples on how the 737's flight warning computer works. We're going to start with a single failure in a redundant system. So let's take a fuel pump. In tank number one we've got two pumps, the forward and the aft. Let's switch the aft pump off, low pressure light illuminates. You can see we do not get any master caution from that. Now let's go ahead and fail the second system, which is the other fuel pump. And you can see now we actually get a master warning or master caution fuel. And that is because a single failure in a redundant system is not going to cause the um, master caution. Only a dual failure will. Another example of something that is not even going to show you a warning is in the um, GPS, for example, or in the pack controllers. So we've got two GPSs or two pack controllers. If a single one of them fails, the airplane doesn't even bother you with it until you actually do a recall to see if any system is actually failed. So let's go ahead, GPS left fail, execute. There are a couple things where we can recognize the failure, however the master caution is not one of them. So we can see down here we've got the GPS left invalid and we can see the time on our clock has vanished and that is the indications we have of this. However we are not seeing anything on the actual panel so no master caution and if you look up here at the IRS panel where the GPS light is situated then you can see that is not illuminated. The reason for that is that it is a redundant system and the right GPS receiver has taken over and therefore the plane does not even alert the pilots to it until you conduct the recall. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We do the recall and now you can see we've got the IRS light illuminated and if we now move to the overhead panel then the GPS light is actually illuminated as well. So the way this works is IRS up here indicates the panel on which the failure has occurred and then we've got the um, light illuminated on that panel that directs us to the exact system. Now if we were to reset the master caution like this the light actually goes out again because once again it is a redundant system and the redundant part has taken over. Alright, so that is an example of a failure in a redundant system. Now, things get a little bit more interesting. Let's quickly fix that GPS. Things get a little bit more interesting when you've got a failure in a system that is not redundant or when your attention is required but without immediate action. And when that happens, let's say for example we turn on the APU bleed. Provided the APU was actually running of course, so Let's quickly go ahead and start that one up. So let me explain you the logic. When we have something where immediate attention of the pilots is needed, like for example the APU bleed being on with the engine bleed on as well, then we get the dual bleed light illuminated because if you advance engine thrust in that situation above idle then you might damage the APU system. So for that immediate pilot attention is required but later pilot action might be required. Now that is an example of uh, one failure that can occur over here and where the airplane is going to alert you. Let's quickly wait until the APU is available. It should be in a couple of moments and then I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like. Right now the master caution panel is not illuminated, so right now we don't have any cautions. Let's go ahead and flick the um, APU generator on. And now let's turn on the APU bleed. You can see the dual bleed light comes on, but since that is out of the primary field of view of a pilot, we get the master caution and the air conditioning up there. And this directs us to the air conditioning panel and if we go up here we can now see the dual bleed light is illuminated. 
and that way we now can take appropriate action. For example, by going into the um, appropriate non-normal checklist, but if you are familiar with a certain checklist and this one only tells us to um, not advance thrust above uh, idle, then you can do it from memory as well. In the Airbus, that is a big no-go. We do all checklists right out of the QRH or out of the ECAM. Okay, so that's an example of a situation like that. So let's now go ahead and view a little bit um, more important thing. So to summarize, when something like this happens, so when a failure happens where immediate pilot detention is required and subsequent action may be required, then we get the um, master caution light with the associated light on the um, recall panel. Now, what, however, if immediate pilot action is required? Well, let's have another look at an example. And for this one, I am once again going to light up our airplane. So let's go to fires. And I want an APU fire. Well, this one obviously brings up a warning horn like the fire warning bell up here. Let's go ahead and cancel that. And then we've also got the master caution APU. But whenever a fire happens, all we need to do is look down here and now we can see the um, APU fire switch illuminated. So, this way we immediately um, have the attention. However, let me show you, after I uh, fix this real quick, let me show you a little... Um, let me show you a little caveat of the 737's warning computers. By the way, quite similar to the Airbus, when in the Boeing you get an APU fire, it doesn't attempt to extinguish itself automatically, but it does recognize the APU fault, so it is going to conduct an auto shutdown. Okay, so let's go ahead and shut that APU down. You can see the fault light remains illuminated, which is an indication for us not to turn the APU on again. Okay, so there is... A little caveat in the 737's warning systems. And this one is in particular for the overheat warnings. So Boeing considers the entire thrust lever quadrant and the engine fire switches to be in the primary field of view of the pilot. So this is what I would normally understand as my primary field of view. However, if you Apparently, look down here, that seems to be, according to Boeing, in your primary field of view as well. Now, if that is really the case, well, there is a lot of debate going on in um, the pilot community among that. But in any case, let me show you something. Not 100% sure this is going to work, but... Okay, it does. Engine overheat. And you now get the um, firebell with master warning overheat detect. However, if you look down there... Okay, this is interesting. The fire switch shouldn't illuminate with that. So this is not represented correctly. Normally you'd only get the um, overheat down there and not the fire switch. So you don't have any attention getters normally for this. And you, Boeing expects you to see this on your own, which is a little bit interesting. So that just goes back to the 60-year-old warning system that you have on the 737. All right, so... With both the Airbus and the Boeing system and their way how they function in mind now, what is actually better than? Well, the regulators around the world are somewhat taking that away from us in that they clearly say the way the ECAM or in the newer Boeings the ICAS works is the better way. And I do fully agree with it. Now, in the 737, if something goes wrong, for example, you get that uh, drive light illuminated up there, then you'd have to go into the paper QRH, find the drive checklist, and not in all cases the checklists have good naming. In most cases, you simply go by the name of what's on the um, indicator there, and you are going to find a checklist. But what, for example, if something is wrong with your flaps? or your slats, and they stop at a position where they are not commanded. Then you have three different checklists available, like an asymmetry, like a skew, and so on, and you will have to find the correct checklist yourself, which can be a little bit tricky. Even though the checklists are built in a way that they try to direct you to the correct checklist if something, um, if you accidentally choose the wrong one. However, the system is not fail-safe, other than the ABBA system, which, well, to my knowledge, hasn't given a faulty um, 
or hasn't given the wrong checklists for a problem that was detected correctly yet. In any case, both of the work and the fact that the 737 is flying for like 60 years now with a warning system like this shows that the system works as well. And seeing that Boeing has just recently been able to pursue the FAA to be able to certify the 737 MAX 10 with the same warning system, even though there were technically speaking have been a bit in the deadline that it wasn't allowed anymore, but they got to convince the FAA to do it that way. So apparently the system is still good enough that it works. And I do have to say on my five years flying the Boeing 737, I felt absolutely comfortable with the way the system worked and pilots were able to work out everything quickly. However, I do have to say that I believe the ABBA system is the superior system. Now, obviously, I don't have the direct comparison between the newer Boeings like the 777, the 787 or 747-8 with their electronic checklist systems, which also pulls up the correct checklist for you and automatically detects system states quite similar to the ABBA's, just with a slightly different layout. So I don't have a direct comparison there, but I'm probably going to do one once the PMDG 777 is released. So that's going to be it for this video guys, thank you very much for watching, do let me know in the video description below which of the two systems you find superior, I'm very much looking forward to read your thoughts on this and how you get to the conclusion that you actually got to, so do put it in the comments below as I'm very much looking forward to read that. Finally if you liked the video do leave a like on YouTube as well as it does help with the algorithms and if you are up for more don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much for watching everyone. Finally, if you do like what I'm doing, I would love a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. But until then, I am totally looking forward to see you all again on the next one. Thank you very much for watching and I see you over then.